I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. We have three wonderful guests with us today. Hey, hi, good morning. Um, so as you may or may not know, the Wizen Gamut <laughs> is the Wizarding World's group of, you all right? You need a little help? Okay, there we go, there we go. <laughs> It's a little tall, yeah. Um, is the Wizarding World's group of legislators and court officials. So they're well-respected witches and wizards in the magical world. And each of the panelists here today were asked because of their expertise in our industry. Uh, they are well-respected in our industry and have a wide range of knowledge and experience. So let's get started introducing them. Uh, Grant Cody, he is an attorney and executive director and fantastic human. Uh, of the, he's the executive director of the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission. Um, he serves as the chairman of the Law and Regulation Committee for Arello, which is the Association of Real Estate Licensed Law Officials, and president of the Foundation Board of Trustees for the Oklahoma City Community College. Uh, in his personal life, he owns commercial, residential, and vacant land here in Oklahoma City, uh, where his family owns and operates a small business since 1959. Um, and then we also have Lee Tran, uh, who I just met this morning, also fantastic. Uh, and she joined Weoki Federal Credit Union in 1995, currently serves as its Assistant Vice President of Mortgage Underwriting. Over the past 28 years, Lee has gained a wealth of knowledge in all aspects of lending, uh, provided education to the industry, gives excellent service to her customers. Uh, her full bio is simply just impressive. Um, she's very active in her community, uh, including serving as board chair of Neighborhood Housing Services of Oklahoma and is a proud mother of two children. She's also board chair for the Oklahoma Credit Union Real Estate Network and incoming president of the Oklahoma Mortgage Bankers Association. So we're glad to have Lee. And last but not least, we have Bryson Panis. Um, Bryson graduated from OU in 2023 with a degree of business entrepreneurship and venture management. Uh, his professional career includes small business, web development and branding, campaign work, bailiff at the Oklahoma County District Courts, and field representative and state director for the United States Senator Jim Inhofe. Uh, Bryson currently lives in Edmond with his wife and three kids uh, and is currently the senior director of government affairs of Oklahoma Association of Realtors. And we have had the opportunity to meet with him and his group a lot uh, and collaborate with them, uh, especially in some of our legislative efforts. And we're very grateful for that, um, that partnership. Thank so you, Laura, thanks that. everybody. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's get started with our exciting questions before the panel, Wizen Gamut panel today. So, okay, okay, all right. First question, and each of you, um, you know, we can start down the line if you want to start or just pop in if you want. Um, first question, what is the biggest challenge to getting a real estate deal closed at the moment, in your opinion? Uh, and, and what could a title company do to alleviate those issues? Sure, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, so just for a really quick context, um, part of my job I have to review, I get to review, uh, between 600 and 800 complaints uh, every year from consumers here in Oklahoma as well as licensed professionals. Uh, those numbers have been going up year over year and um, I, you know, it's really interesting because I think it gives a, a unique perspective in what goes wrong in a lot of transactions and as part of that review I also get to look through all the paperwork that goes on in those transactions. So. Um, I told myself that if I were going to give some advice today or give some feedback, I would try to give a couple practical takeaways from things I've seen in like some paperwork that I thought like was really well done and you can actually see when some of those things make a difference. So um, I will just say the thing, the biggest thing I see is just uh, education issues to be perfectly honest with you and, and all the new hurdles that people are you know, facing. You mentioned buyer affidavit requirements. There's so much change going on right now and I know we've had a lot of real estate licensees in Oklahoma who've had their license for like 10 years but when I think about what that experience has been, it's mostly been a good market, you know, and a lot of the changes they're facing uh, they haven't dealt with before and that's becoming very evident in a lot of the things that I see every day. Um, so I think that is kind of the biggest issue at the moment. Um, as far as, I, and I also would say competency with contracts as well, and I will just mention that the commission is increasing the number of hours for all real estate licensees from one hour every three years to six hours every three, uh, every three years. And so uh, we're kind of doing what we can to make that better. We've got another, a bunch of other initiatives, but I, I won't bore you with that. Um, here's, here's a couple things that I've seen in, you know, the paperwork that we get from brokers and agents when they've got complaints filed that I think, you know, shows like how you guys are able to kind of overcome some of those obstacles with so much that's changing right now. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was that um, I've noticed in looking at the paperwork that some of your systems are CCing brokers and some are not. And it, honestly, there's a big difference in a lot of the complaints and deals that are being saved versus not saved 
by CCing brokers and letting them know, hey, there's an issue in this transaction with this agent. Um, if there's a cloud of title or an encroachment, um, again, I would, I, when brokers are CC'd on that stuff, I think that's helpful. I also think in a lot of the emails that are sent out to people, like, here's your title commitment. If there's an issue, I, I've noticed that, like, there's a lot of times that issues you are contained in that, that agents either don't know how to read or not aware of, and so those things come up too late in a transaction. Um, so I've actually noticed that um, some of you are um, sending a note in the email saying, like, hey, by the way, here's a title commitment, and here's an issue. Um, so I, those things, although simple, make a really big difference. Um, you know, we understand, like, agents are the ones that are bringing, you know, business to the table. Um, but I, I've noticed a, a huge difference uh, in transactions that are being saved versus not saved. So a lot of obstacles to overcome right now. There's a lot of change coming, more change coming on the way. Um, I think it's extremely important, the communication factor. Well, our next speaker um, gets ready, Lee. Um, I, I just two quick things as a follow-up, and I think um, education. What a wonderful opportunity for all of you all in your own communities to do. And rely on your association, rely on your underwriters to help support that because I, I, I know that that's where we've been able to make the biggest difference over the years, and especially as, as you teach them how to interpret their contract through our eyes as well. Uh, the other thing, too, is CCing agents. And I remember, you know, Marianne, this might still be a deal, I don't know. But we, um, we would have brokers and agents who would not want us to communicate directly with their clients. And it's a little bit frustrating because what ends up is that telephone game, right? And so here's the problem. It goes through the agent or the broker, and they don't know how to explain it to their or they don't want to deliver bad news. And, I, and I'm not sure how to deal with that when we have a customer that's our realtor broker says, do not contact my customer. We have to remember that there are proposed insureds, and we do have an obligation to let them know or copy them. So I appreciate that comment, because that's tricky for us. Yeah, and I, I would just say, you know, keep in mind that most of the time, even though you're dealing with an agent, right, like the brokerage is the one that actually owns the listing. That's who the listing agreement signed with. And uh, now that we're going to be doing a lot more buyer broker agreements, most of them are going to be written that way too. So I don't think there's anything wrong. I understand, you know, that it's not always like the happiest day and if for an agent to have. Uh, not all relationships are, are the best there, but um, honestly, when it comes to issues, uh, there's a huge difference between the deals that are being saved and frankly, the consumer complaints that we see too. Um, the earlier that they can know something's wrong and have an opportunity to fix it, the better. Thank you. All right, Lee. Good morning. Thank you for having me, and um, I've never been to this convention before, but thank you from, for inviting me. Um, I will add on to what um, Codis mentioned about communication. I think that's what you guys do best, so keep that communication line open for lenders as well. You know, as soon as we know the issue, whether it's bad or good, deliver that news. You know, working with the buyers on my side of it, we've always been very, try to be consistent. Um, in the same line as what title companies are reading and they're abstracting when that delivery of news, whatever that might be, an encroachment or whatever it is, knowing about it early enough to cure or to offer a solution is the key for us to make a successful closing and help or guide, or guide our buyers through that process and same with seller. So I appreciate for everything you guys do and just keep doing what you do best. Keep that communication going. I don't know that I have, <coughs> excuse me. Well, thank you as well, and good morning. I did hear uh, that I graduated in 2023, and I wanted to clarify that was actually 2008, so it wasn't last year. <laughs> I was like, I did not did a lot in a year. You were listening, good job. I know. The, <laughs> um, but no, thanks for having me, and I've been with the Realtors Association just for about the last two years, and so I've kind of taken a deep dive into your world and the realtor world and the agent world, and a lot in the law side as doing government affairs up with legislation and whatnot. So I reached out to a few of our members that um, I know have been in and around the industry for a long time and are involved in our association for a little bit of input, Really, it was kind of the same thing with regard to this question, communication slash education, but really it was like timing. I have, we hear things from time to time about the abstract not coming back in time. A lot of times some of our um, more rural communities or environments or counties that they, they experience that in. And that other than that, it was like 
don't change what you're doing. I mean, I think it was a very good, like, it seems like our realtor members are getting educated and know how to do that. I don't hear, you know, those complaints or things that come up with, with that regard quite like, I don't know. I think, frankly, in other environments might, or other states might happen or something. I don't know, or it's happened in the past, but... Um, but no, that, that'd be the only feedback I really got was just make sure those timings, I guess, because you don't want that closing to fall through, so. It's like timeliness is the issue. Do they ever talk about cost? The expense. And the, and the reason I bring that up is that's, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, I'm sure. Uh, but the, the expense as being a barrier to home ownership. This may be a thing for you, um, Lee. In, uh, I'm going off script. Oh, imagine that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll talk about that. I'm, I'm sure that Don Kennedy will talk about that a little bit later, too. Um, but I'm curious, just here on a local level, um, do the realtors or maybe even the lenders uh, ever talk about the expense from the, from the standpoint of buyers or sellers or borrowers? Does that ever come up? I know expense comes up in a maybe a broader sense i think it, the expense of actually going to the club like i don't know they say you want the buyer to basically not have have to owe anything there and so i think that that was um the things i hear about from an expense standpoint i think are peripheral to that actual like title work that's done honestly there's things that um happen before then getting certain documents before is where i really see things with expense come up um, and those sorts of requirements to actually, I don't know, getting up to the table as a little bit, but not, um, I don't know. The And even in law, you might be able to clarify, Grant, but I, I think there's pretty specific, more specific things with regard to title companies and costs than I've seen on some of the other things that touch real estate or that I've seen, so. Timeliness, urgency, right? Yeah. Well, let's transition into um, something else happening on the national scale. So maybe, Bryson, you can speak to this first. Uh, many of you all remember last month, uh, the National Association of Realtors um, announced a settlement agreement in a lawsuit uh, having to do with commission structures and fee negotiations. And, um, and there are other lawsuits kind of popping up, you know, being consolidated and things like that. Um, so this is a two-part question for you um, because we heard a lot uh, right afterwards. I had realtor friends that were very concerned, title companies, like, what are we going to see? Sarah and I talked about, you know, what would the, would the contract look different? You know what? So we start blowing things all up before we even really know the details and we have to deal with things. So from your perspective, um, for each one of you, what would you want title companies to know about the NAR settlement and its impact on Oklahoma realtors, Oklahoma borrowers, um, and what might the title companies expect to see differently in their closings and their relationships uh, with their customers? I'll take, I guess, the first part of the main takeaway. A lot's changed almost on a weekly basis the last couple weeks. Um, we even had some of SB 1920 as a Bill, you mentioned earlier, but even had a little bit of work that we did on that. And really the main takeaway that I think we've all had to consume is that this is changing from week to week or month to month. And those implications, we really don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. I see different states having to deal with things much differently across the nation. And so there's just really a lot of, I don't know if I'd call it confusion, but speculation out there that people want answers and especially our realtors come and our national is doing, you know, webinars every week for, for leadership and things like that. Um, and so they're wanting answers for sure. The main takeaway that I've been talking um, or using, I guess, uh, to explain it to people outside the industry even is that really this most recent settlement out of Washington says that you are not allowed to post commissions on MLS. And so our agents can still post them on their private websites. You can still do that. You can still educate your customers. But that was the main, one of the main things that came from this most recent settlement there. I would also mention that the Department of Justice is also involved and has been for the recent years in 
I guess, um, I don't know exactly what the intention would be over time or why it started, but they almost seem to be on the opposite side of this settlement and where they're saying we want it required to be posted, um, the 3% or the commission or the compensation. And so there's conflicting sort of federal jurisdictions that are still kind of, we're waiting to see what will play out. And the last thing I'll mention, because you had brought up consolidation, this most recent judgment on the settlement, am I saying that correctly? I keep looking at Grant because I'm like, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but um, that, that, I don't know if it, who would have asked it, but I guess NAR asked that these all be consolidated and there's implications there and reasons for that beyond just let's get it over right now for clarity. Um, but that was not a, the judge said they cannot be consolidated. And so that does open it up now, all the lawsuits still out there, everybody around the nation sort of looking back at those, okay, back, back to here, that didn't get taken care of, so. Yeah, I think the concern there is inconsistent rulings if, if they're not consolidated. So continuing on before we get to borrowers, I, I wanna talk about borrowers here in a minute, but what, what do you see from an impact on our licensees grant? Okay, so <clears throat> the biggest thing I would say is that uh, first that I want everyone to know, and I would appreciate it if you would pass this along to agents, is that the state of Oklahoma has nothing to do with this. Uh, it's kind of amazing, you know, when the news came out, um, our emails, our phones just blew up, and it's, it's been that way, you know, why aren't you guys doing more, et cetera. Um, so the state of Oklahoma really has nothing to do with this. That being said, you know, um, and I think Monica can probably attest to this, that we don't stay in our lane that much. We're trying to do more, right? We're trying to go above and beyond in, in our role. Um, the biggest thing to me, honestly, is just going to be when I think about for the perspective of licensee is just the impact this is going to have on them. I'm sure, like, like what I'm seeing, you all get a front row view in real time to some of those fun TRR negotiations and things that spill over to the closing table. I have seen countless examples this year of agents giving up money to make a deal go through, and I think that's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I think we're going to see more. I think a lot of the issues we're having now will be exacerbated. I think because the DOJ is pushing... Uh, the idea that, hey, a, a seller and a buyer should be negotiating more and negotiating more directly, um, I think that's going to make things harder for agents, especially because in Oklahoma we don't have agency, we're not a fiduciary state, so um, I think you're going to see a lot of change over the next two years. I think you're going to see the Broker Relationships Act change. I think you're going to see some statutory change here in Oklahoma. I also think you're going to see some really interesting brokerage models pop up or, you know, um, sidearms of brokerages. So, um, you know, for example, I think you might see some brokerages offer things like financing commissions through either them, like their arm or another arm or a partner of theirs. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of non-exclusive versus exclusive buyer broker agreements. Um, I know, you know, in talking to like Zillow and counsel for some of those guys that they're going to probably be, you know, putting together a buyer broker agreement that's non-exclusive and I, I think a, a consumer probably won't even really know what they're signing when they sign that. Um, I think, um, you know, duty, I, I, I talked about duties and responsibilities changing. Um, I, I also think we're going to see a lot of issues, uh, frankly speaking, with agents not staying within the guardrails. So I think about the terms of the settlement agreement or the proposed settlement agreement. Um, you know, one of them being like compensation for a buyer's agent has to be what they agreed to in their buyer broker agreement. It cannot be more than that. And so I think, you know, from a buyer's agent who's helping somebody and maybe they agreed to get compensated $1,000 and then they end up, you know, finding a, a property and the compensation from seller is, hey, way more than that. Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, from an agent's perspective, that's not a very happy day to find something like that. So, but I think about, you know, agents that are going to be doing things because they're entering territory where there's no one's traveled before. And again, most of the people in our industry here in Oklahoma have been doing this a set way for the last 10, 12 years. And while there's been some changes, they've kind of learned the steps of a transaction, right? And I, I think what I see uh, every day is that there's a, a gap between, hey, something's changed. How do we, how do we adjust to that? And so um, I, I just think but, that you're going to see a lot of increased issues. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's the way we've always done it, right? <laughs> Oh, a thousand percent, a uh, hundred percent. A uh, couple other things I just wanted to mention, you know, I th I, w when I mentioned compensation now, I just think you're going to see agents do things like maybe uh, we'll get some first impression interesting cases, right? Like um, I could see an agent saying, okay, hey, let's, uh, let's, um, let's amend this buyer broker agreement or, or execute a new one that says a new type of compensation. And that might trigger some legal issues like, well, hey, um, what did you, what, what, 
service are you providing in addition to what you already agreed to, right? There might be some unjust enrichment or other issues that pop up, oh, yeah. so. A definite RESPA violation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. I also think we're going to see a lot of veteran buyer issues. That's one issue for me in particular. I know we're talking about licensees, but just one thing that doesn't really get talked about that much is how this is hurting veterans, right? They can't finance their commissions through a VA loan. They are not allowed to compensate a, you know, a buyer's agent. So, um, you know, as the DOJ kind of squeezes this cooperative compensation out, I just think it's, you're going to have people that are really hurt by that. It's going to be harder than ever to be a buyer's agent for those people. And when I think about, one of the questions I've gotten from agents is, you know, if I'm not able to see the compensation on MLS, like, what am I supposed to do, Grant? Am I supposed to just pick up the phone and start calling people and asking? Um, so we've got a lot of you know, ground to cover. And honestly, I, you know, I'm still just sort of waiting for the proposed settlement to actually be approved. Um, we're, we're moving on a bunch of education things, but, you know, let's not put the cart before the horse. That's a really good segue into, oh, go ahead. Look, before I we was just going to say, we'll be up for our DC fly-in, the national fly-in for realtors next month. And that VA loan implication is at least from our Oklahoma delegation going up there, our number one talking point on that. So hopefully there's more to come. That's good. Well, that's a nice transition to Lee because we did talk about VA. We did talk about, um, you know, the ability to qualify, how hard it is to come up with that down payment, those kinds of things. When you just said financing it, like, you know, my left arm went numb because I thought, you know, they'll want to secure it by the real estate. And how does that impact? So as a mortgage underwriter, Lee, how are you all following this issue? You know, I will add on the VA. That's a disadvantage, and it's unfortunate, you know, if we don't have – new guidance come out um, to really act on behalf of our veterans, what do we do then? You know, so I, I hope, I hope that will be fair when the new guidance come out to our veterans buyers. Affordability is another issue. So we, when you think about another 3% for buyers to come up with, we're having struggles right now qualifying uh, people to get into a home. Home ownership has always been an issue and it's getting worse and I feel like you know, affordability, not just housing costs, but now you're adding on to reserves and down payment. It's, it's huge for a first-time buyer or even seasoned buyers trying to sell and buy, and what, are, what do they do? So education. I think it's so important, you know, to be transparent. Um, I had the opportunity to visit with some of the agents and brokers recently, and for me, from the lending side for so many years, I never got to see and stop and think, okay, what does it look like on the other side for our agents? My goodness, I, I got put through the walk of, you know, preparing, prepping a home, getting it listed, getting it on the market to be competitive, and same time, protecting the buyer seller, making all those trips to showing homes and knowing, you know, will you get paid at the end of that road? So you know, for me, I have empathy for our, our realtors, but I applaud you guys for staying, you know, on top of it all and providing education, directing, not just selling agents, listing agents, bars, lenders, you know, where do we go? So for me, a lot of that, it's important, comes with education. But at the end of the day, no matter what roles we play, as a realtor, as a lender, as a, a buyer, seller, we all have impacted the market in some shape or form. And one of the things that came up in this conversation with our realtors and agents and uh, brokers, you know, is what if, and this you know, how could it impact everything if, if what if? So if there's a broker and buyer agent um, agreement in place, what if today we look at pre-approval, pre-qual letters? What if there's a pre-approval, a conditional pre-approval letter integrated into that? And if it's made part of the contract, what could that look like? You know, for me, it would provide transparency, maybe set expectations. Could that help with negotiations you know, so that's, that's on the table, and that's one of the things that um, the brokers are bringing up. Could that be made part of a requirement on the contract? A conditional pre-approval letter from the lender stating loan amount, sales price, sell a contribution max. And I think because there's so many questions come through our doors, like, what, are, what is the seller contribution maximum on this loan? And it's going to be different from every buyer, depending on their down payment, of course. So I know you guys have systems out there in technology that provide cost estimate. Someone goes in, put in a sales price, loan amount, probably a county, 
and it'll tell them an estimated cost. So what if you add something to that to say seller contribution maximum? If it's a VA loan, a conventional, a FHA, this is what you could expect. So could that help the negotiation process? I don't know. So I think it could. Um, it could in some way, you know, limit some calls, some guessing, guesswork during that negotiation. And I agree with Grant. When you leave it out there for buyer and seller to negotiate, ooh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where that's going. You know, I, I, I feel like we're always going to need our agents and we're all going to need you guys um, to help lead that pack, you know, with education. So I really am appreciative of everybody in this room and all that we do and just to be the, the voice for our people in the community and hopefully the OMBA, the Oklahoma Mortgage Bankers will continue to advocate, you know, for what's right uh, for our buyers or even sellers, um, the community here we serve in Oklahoma. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you for that on everyone. And I think that kind of makes me think about one thing that's wonderful about our industry is we're very good at creative problem solving, um, but making sure we have proper education out there so that those creative solutions uh, are not crazy uh, and are actually legal, I think that's crucial. Um, so, you know, fix the puzzle piece um, within the confines of these, you know, four uh, guardrails, right? So, okay, next question, and we'll start with Grant and go this way now. Or, and then the last question, we'll start with Lee. <laughs> um, so Grant, what are the key success factors for a smooth real estate closing experience, in your opinion? Okay, um, I will just say again, communication, setting expectations early. Um, you know, unfortunately, we see a lot of times like a licensee who's, you know, or a complaint that's like, hey, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, I wasn't updated. I got this, you know, I got a, maybe a disclosure or something late. Um, it, it happens all the time. So setting expectations, um, regularly checking in, you know, I, I, I think it's just the basic stuff to be perfectly honest. And I, I get it. It's hard. You know, I, I think about um, when I was in like college, when I was waiting tables and, you know, people say like, how could you forget that? Well, if you've got like a hundred people to take care of and there's three people working here, it's possible you'll forget somebody. So I think about that when I look at agents who are doing like high volume, but um, yeah, honestly, just setting expectations, letting people know when there's issues, communicating, communicating in writing and documenting, um, you know, the best agents I see are, are people who are documenting everything, every step of the way. And so anytime there's an issue, they can say, hey, here's everything. Here's my timeline. Here's everything in writing. Um, I think that is the best thing that, honestly, just setting expectations and communication. Yeah. So I, I'm going to just add one quick thing. Four words and how this impacts what you all see. For sale, everybody, by <laughs> owner. Like, how does that, how, do you get questions? Because that's, um, that's difficult for us. So I think we're all seeing more for sale by owners. They think they can do it on Zillow themselves. They can, all those kinds of things. Do you see that at the commission when things go wrong? Oh, definitely. Uh, I actually tell people all the time that, you know, even though I'm a regulator, I encourage people, you know, they might think like, oh, this guy's anti, you know, licensee or something. But uh, the truth is like the biggest issues and the most complaints we get are when there's not a competent professional involved in the transaction. And honestly, from the state of Oklahoma's perspective, the, the, the biggest threats to our consumers are unlicensed activity. Uh, people who don't live here, people who are not licensed here, we've got, you know, deed fraud, we've got, I mean, just, it's it's really insane to see the wide variety of issues that we have. So, um, but yeah, always when we don't have licensed professionals involved, it, it, that's when it's worse. So um, I have to tell you that the state has a vested interest in making sure that there is a licensed professional involved in a transaction as much as possible. And I know, um, you know, on a lot of wholesale deals that go through title companies, you guys have the, are, are really the ones that are making those survive because they're su such a hot mess. Um, if I could just like plug one little takeaway as well, which is a kind of an ADHD thought since I mentioned wholesaling, um, I, I would really appreciate it if, um, you know, pointing out to our agents, I, I've noticed that there's a really bad <laughs> habit of just thinking, hey, I put and or assigns on the contract so I can go ahead and assign this without doing anything else. Um, it's amazing. We've bolded and underlined that language. I know Monica was there when we did that. Uh, that says that our, our residential sales contract can't be assigned without further written agreement. So I think that would be awesome if that's something that we could point out as much as possible. Please support Senate Bill 979. So there you go. 927, yes. <laughs> 100%. You know, so keep that communication line open. Whether it's good or bad, just make sure that everybody's informed, educated, and um, offer solutions. That's one thing that I, I always make sure my team is aware of, 
is you always, always, always communicate with all parties involved as much as possible. Privacy information, yes, there are things that we have limitations on, but do always talk to your closers and make sure they understand everything that's going on before you deliver that news to. So yeah, 100%. And for sale by owner, um, oh wow, I, I don't know where to go with that, but you know, I do see some ish, some things that came up. I mean, just recently this week, I was looking at one that was sold last year. And I, I, I can't say, you know, value have gone up tremendously in the past year, but I see one that started with an agent and then it ended up with just buyer and seller negotiating on their own and there were money left on the table, definitely. It was huge, it was huge and I just couldn't believe when I saw it and I said, is this possible, you know, but that could, that could happen. So I wonder, you know, if, if regulations, when the final guidance come out that we don't scare to, you know, people off, from being able to do what they do today. They just need to be mindful of, of to stay within our, our guardrails of where we go with each transaction. But I think everybody's going to need each other, especially our agents, to represent buyer and seller in every transaction. is so important um, not to leave that money on the table. Only thing I might add, and, and everyone's kind of alluded to it, but in writing seems to be something I have experienced across the board a lot um, this year and I've just heard it a lot across the board I would say but that was sort of the, the feedback these key success factors from our a lot of the realtors were saying you know I've used written agreements even though I didn't need to kind of going that extra step already is the standard for hopefully we would thank all of our realtors and we we want to promote that and so that was a lot of feedback I got was the key and maybe they're thinking a little bit more to the entire process um, but keeping things in writing clearly so you can present them the right way to your your clients or whatnot yeah, and I would just add one more thing to proactive communication with the agent or broker that's involved um, you know asking questions like hey have you looked at this issue also resources um, you know I think about little changes that were made this year that have maybe not gone super noticed um, so I think about the residential sales contract adding language for the buyer affidavit requirement. And when you look at the language that's in there, there's like two or three different statutes that are referenced. And when I think about, you know, um, just being a, a random buyer, uh, if I saw that, I, I would be overwhelmed. I would say, I, I don't know what these laws mean, but I don't want to be in trouble, you know? Um, so um, when I think about resources, I think about having things like, hey, we have copies of that statute, um, or hey, we've put an infographic together uh, that is written for a fifth grader that kind of explains some stuff to you. Um, that's something that the Real Estate Commission is doing with our real estate licensees, and I think um, it's, it's definitely shown some success as far as getting the bottom line across on a couple of key uh, factors. That's great. Um, well, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, I want to ask one last question, but before I do, you mentioned communication. This is top of mind of both Sarah and I. Sarah spoke on this yesterday at the South Oklahoma City uh, Attorneys Group. I've spoken to uh, the Oklahoma City Group. And when you're uh, in the world of email, we want to put it in writing so there's no confusion. Be careful about CCing and BCCing and reply all. Yeah. So be careful about your reply all. And you know maybe that's something that we want to talk about uh, in our association about the ethical issues and privacy that you just mentioned, Lee, because um, we have a tendency to hit that reply all button, and we don't always look to see who was on that uh, email chain, and it could be someone uh, of the other side or whatever the case might be. And in escrow, when we represent all and none at the same time, um, it, uh, it it can be a little bit tricky. But a topic for another day. But that does kind of lead into our last question for the panel, uh, which is about thinking about the future. And um, Karen's going to talk about this a little bit later. Where are you, Karen? I lost you. Oh, there you are, back there. Yeah. She's going to talk about uh, real-time payments uh, this afternoon. We had a bill that we're hoping that will run next year on good funds. Oklahoma is only one of six states that don't have a good fund. So this is a teaser. So you'll want to listen to what Karen has to say this afternoon. So that real-time payments, you know, being able to accept Venmo or, you know, I don't, nobody uses pop money anymore, but except babysitters. But, um, you know, some of those kinds of things um, that will help facilitate closings in the future. 
So where do you all see your little crystal balls of regulations and advocacy and the like? Where do you see, um, you know, our industry going in terms of the closing experience? More Ron, less Ron, more things just on your phone? I'll, I'll start with you, Lee. You know, technology is changing. It's forever going to change. I remember, you know, when Tread came out, it was just like broke all of us, right? And me staying up 4 a.m., sitting on calls with vendors to make sure things work properly when the doors open at 9, that was tough. That was tough, but we made it. We made it. So I think we just need to keep an open mind and an and open door, you know, to accept change and to adapt to changes and um, always, no matter what technology we use, we'll always need people's eyes on things. So for me, you know, a lot of times we get questions like, Cryptocurrency, can I use that for my down payment closing? Can I bring that, you know, can I transfer? Or, you know, for us on the GSE side of it, they say no. We have to always verify the source of funds, and that's just because of the um, Patriot Act that we have to follow to verify funds where it came from. And so reporting things that we see that are unusual activities and such, you know, so things that like that, I don't know where that's going to evolve, but I think it will forever change depending on consumer demands. So it's gonna, it's gonna, be, it's gonna come down to that. Um, what is common, what's customary, that's gonna be recognized and that'll become part of what we advocate for. Yeah, I guess if it's the looking forward, what do we see change? Um, I've, I don't know, my brain sort of goes to technology and business anyway, outside of more government stuff. So seeing sort of from an outsider's perspective how technology might, I see a lot of opportunity. I feel like there's big fish out there in the technology world and also reminding people, I guess, that MLS is online as well, didn't always, wasn't always that way. And so there just seems to be a lot of opportunity or changes happening, I guess, changes that are breeding opportunity. I would honestly kind of, um, I don't know, I just think there's excitement, even though there's a lot of headaches and a lot of anxiousness, I think that that working through it, there really is opportunity for realtors or, or the technology side. I've had someone tell me that their peak listing during COVID in 2021, someone had in, I think, a day and a half, she said, 37 offers. And she was like, I hadn't had more than like three. And now it's almost feels like the opposite of that is happening in a very short time. And so I think there's a lot of changes, but um, I'm not sure what, you know, technology, I, who knows? Who knows what, what will rise to the top? Yeah, to, to piggyback on that, I'll, I'll just say if you had asked me five years ago what would change, I never would have come up with half of the things that have happened to where we are now. Um, so I, I don't know how good I would do at, at predicting the future. But uh, to your point, yeah, I, th I think you're going to see closings become more remote. Um, you know, I think you're going to see fewer people who are able to buy homes. And the ones that who, who can buy homes are probably going to be doing it in more states and therefore doing it more remotely, right? I think that the pool of people who will be buying is going to be smaller. It's going to be kind of the more usual players, more investors, that sort of thing. So um, I think it's going to become a little less personal down the road. Uh, I also, where I am most interested as a law nerd, though, is like what's going to change with our statutes? What's going to change nationally? Because right now, I think what's so interesting is like the backdrop of all these changes. Um, yeah, we all do real estate, you know, relatively the same uh, state to state, but when you go state to state with regulations and you drill down, they're so different. Um, going back to the, the really quick to the, the veteran issue, you know, one thing that came up a couple days ago when I was talking to some other attorneys, um, you know, in, in other states that do what I do, um, North Carolina, for example, they've got like an obscure administrative code that no one was really paying attention to that does not allow, it prohibits um, agents and brokers from offering compensation through the contract, which is, you know, one of the most popular tools that we're seeing uh, since this proposed settlement came out, is making a term of the contract, here's my, you know, compensation as the buyer's agent. So um, I just think it's going to be really interesting because we're going to see tons and tons of legislation introduced over the next couple of years in all kinds of different states. And as you know, people love to copy and paste. So I think, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what trends take hold and, and I would be, you know, I'm probably not the best person <laughs> to predict what those trends will be, though. Yeah, I, I want to add, you know, what AI can do today. What does that look like in the next five years? 
right now we're talking about fair lending. If we're using AI to scan application, is that fair? I'd probably say no. You know, so that's something that's been the talks and within the lending side of it, how much technology is being utilized to um, review applications, underwriting that applications. You know, at the end of the day, we still have somebody's eyes on it. So I, I would say rest assured, you know, there's technologies there, but there's also people looking over things, as you can see. <laughs> so I'm, I'm anxious to see, you know, cybersecurity has always been on top of mind and always an issue and be careful what we do out there and such. So um, as we step up and step into this, this new age of faster, who gets there fastest, we get that closing done, that's where people are going to drive to. And I see that happening now, you know, um, could I do this over the phone? Could I just, because I'm on the go, I don't have time to sit at my computer. I'm not in my office, I'm not at home. So that's where they're going to look to is their phone. Can they do their business there? And that's where I feel like that's probably what we need to um, look into to how to adapt and changes will come. But how do we do that internally and how to support each other? I'm really glad you brought up AI, uh, artificial intelligence, because um, I, I've spoken on this recently and I've had to look into it a little bit more um, in, a, in a more detailed lens. And uh, you're right, the presence of AI does provide that breeding ground for opportunity, but also we need to make sure that it's being properly regulated uh, in an ethical way. That's part of what I spoke about was kind of the ethical use of AI uh, in a legal practice. But I think each of you need to also be doing that for your own businesses. There's a lot of fabulous opportunity to implement it for marketing purposes and um, you know other things like that. But of course, there are major privacy concerns, especially with the free ones that are available. Um, there are, of course, uh, with opportunity comes uh, vendors that want to come in and, and uh, help you use that technology in efficient ways that are more secure. And there's a lot of really great vendors that are out there. Um, so I encourage you to start looking into it now because I think if you don't, you're going to be behind the eight ball. Uh, and so I, I think it's something that you can start looking into uh, and, and exploring for yourself. And nothing can replace artificial intelligence except for real intelligence. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this out to the crowd. If you have a moment, um, I'd like to entertain questions from the group. You have our three best and brightest from uh, our partner industries here. Does anybody have any questions? Ryan. My biggest delay that I see as a title attorney is, is realtors not being confident enough to describe the property that they're going to be attacking or whatever. Okay, I'll try and re repeat this question in a more diplomatic fashion. <laughs> there is a, one of the delays is getting the right information to start the order. And a lot of that sometimes um, the challenge is getting the right legal description. So again, maybe that's education. And, and we might be able to talk about how we can help our realtors do a better job of starting their orders. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, one thing I think about, uh, I would agree with you 100 percent. And I actually mentioned earlier, like competency with contracts is one of the biggest issues I frequently see that people are, you know, they learn the steps, but they don't know what the provisions actually say and don't follow them, don't communicate them. Uh, that's why we've upped the education and honestly uh, one of the things that we've done that's kind of non-obvious as well is we're working with our local associations in Tulsa and Oklahoma City to basically try to get everybody using one set of forms, right? I think it's, it, we need that. In, in order to have good contract education in real estate, you're going to have to say we're all talking about the same thing, right? Um, so we're making some steps to kind of set the table for that to get better. I would 100% agree with you. Um, but I think, you know, I've had to learn in my role that in order to succeed, I have to go above and beyond. And I, I would say the same applies in, in kind of through your lens of, you know, it, those are things we can do, right? We can check in and say, hey, is this right? Um, forming relationships and, and, and communicating on those things is, is, is vital. But I, yeah, that issue is honestly going to be there for a while. I think that that's why the state is trying to make the contract a little simpler, trying to get everybody on uniform language and then trying to up the education. But um, I think we're going to be struggling with that for a while. I think, you know, the biggest thing too I, I look at is, is as we're navigating these changes for the first 12 months, you're not going to have everybody using the same forms. You're going to have people using some, some really um, interesting forms. So. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think we're going to keep seeing those issues. We've had a couple of disciplinary disciplinary cases this year where somebody actually sold the wrong property. So, um, yeah, those 
we're an apprenticeship state, and I think you know what what that means is you've got to you know have your license for years before you go be a broker. And I think we've kind of done things the same way for so many decades now. Um, I don't know that the model has kept up with all the changes, right? If I'm a broker, it's really hard for me to catch something like that that early in the transaction process if I've got 200 agents. So I think um, it's going to take a village to address that issue. <laughs> it really will. But that's the way we've always done it, right? Um, but, but I think putting systems and processes in place to make sure those questions are being asked on the front end, like you point out, is really crucial. I always loved whenever I got an order um, uh, with when I was with First American, uh, when I know my order desk was asking those questions before I had to, and that was so crucial. So putting in those systems and processes uh, on the front end uh, is really key to preventing some of those unnecessary delays yeah, and angry <laughs> questions from your examiner. <laughs> That's it, I, and I get that. I feel your pain, Ryan. Um, we used to do a class for realtors about uh, the top 20 questions to ask at a listing. That was really popular. I may have to dust that off for you guys one of these days. But who better to talk about sources to confirm real uh, legal descriptions but you? And again, another opportunity, another marketing opportunity for your, your group. Yeah, I agree. As a lender, we always look to you guys to, for the correct legal description because sometimes we don't get all pages of the contract. And so we, that's, that's not, that's, that's just the norm, right? But anyway, we do look to our title partners to get the correct legal description and property information, anything that's involved with that property. When we can't deal directly with the seller, we go, we look to you guys. Yep. yep. Uh, do we have time for one more question? We good on time? Okay. Any other questions for our wonderful panel? Viewer? Oh, yep. <laughs> or contract doesn't have all the parties that are under contract with it, mm -hmm. even in the contract description. And we showed up the other day and we showed up with, we had two buyers on it and there were four sets, I mean two sellers on it and there were four sets. By the time we got the classification, more Jefferson Keys was buying if they're married, where they're located, if the company they're employed with. And I know this is an Yeah, I would just, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's totally fair to say that. You know, I, I will tell you that we did recently update all of the questions on the exam to make them more practical, more practice focused, because we, not only was our pass rate low, but we just felt like the number of people who are going into a brokerage day one don't know some of the practical things that they should know that's going to hurt a consumer or cause a very fun headache for their broker. So uh, on the education front, there are a number of initiatives to address that. But I, honestly, I think one of the things I'm taking, so thank you very much for that from the panel today and being part of here, is, is just the opportunity for us to get together and have our groups have more discussion. And honestly, from the state's perspective, since you're not a regulated group, very, you know, there's not that much regulation around it. I think you know, having more conversations and opportunities for you to tell me, like, hey, these are a lot of the problems we're having with some of these licensees, um, I, that would be really, really helpful. So maybe Monica can help us get together a little bit more regularly moving forward to get some of that feedback more directly and quickly. Yeah, I like some of the contract that comes in that has a cover page that tells you who are the parties are involved, including the lender in there. And some of them do have like contact email addresses, but not all the seller's information. So I, I agree, something like a cover page. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. That's super helpful. That's 
Yeah, maybe, yeah, we'll take that up at the next meeting. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think, yeah, again, systems, processes in place, making sure that that's part of your own internal process, but also um, educating and maybe others will adopt it as well, so. I might just add, sorry, oh, yeah, one right, thing. Go ahead. There's, with the changes in our, our association world with the realtors, as the state association, we've actually started speaking a lot more. We have a, a fairly recent recent new CEO, I guess, that started beginning of February. But we might see changes in our local boards. And from the education side, he's really, we're trying to, I guess, position the association to partner more and develop education programs that may or may not have done been done in the past or may have gone away, but there's a very, we are wanting to sort of provide that service to our local board. So hopefully, and please, re exactly what you said, Grant, you guys keep reaching out and we'll having, have discussions and hopefully can get a better, I don't know, framework for all of our localities across the state through that, so. If I can add one more thing, for anyone who feels passionately on like, hey, there's some feedback I wanna get out there or some education I wanna get out there, um, if you download our mobile app, if you go to like the App Store and type in Oklahoma Real Estate Commission, you'll see there's a mobile app on there that's got like a video library and a bunch of resources. We're trying to vastly increase how much stuff is on there and we're trying to partner with professionals in different parts of the industry who have good feedback, have good education. So if there's, if that's anything that you'd ever want to help out with, we just reach out to me or, or reach out to Monica and, and get my contact yeah, info or, or Sarah. Um, yeah, the, anything we could do, but our, our goal is to end up having about 50 to 100 videos on there um, by the end of next fiscal year, and all of those videos being instructional, educational, and under five minutes, because we know people are not gonna watch them if they're any longer. Yeah, I, it, right, there you go. I, I do feel like there's some major collaborations that can happen here uh, through all of this, and I've gotta commend especially the Real Estate Commission, um, but it sounds like Mortgage Brokers Association and the Association of Realtors, all of them have education on their forefront. Um, so again, collaborations uh, are just crucial in what we need to do. So uh, let's uh, have a round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you.